When we first arrived at Falderbrennen, there was a great uncertainty of what the future of Falderbrennen was. So they recruited us to develop vision, find a way forward. I still remember the morning that I cried out to God and said, Lord, we don't know why you would want us here. And we don't know what you want to do with this place. And the first thing he said was, it's because you don't know what you're doing and you know that you don't know that I want you here. Because that means you can only ask me. The reason I want you here and my purpose for the place is to develop it as a house of prayer for all nations. And suddenly, people started turning up here. And we said, okay, God, you can do extraordinary things wherever you like. And from there on, of course, it's grown to say that we are perpetually visited by people from nations absolutely around the world. chapel at Falderbrennen, as you can see, where we hold our rhythm of daily prayer. It's a place where many people have come to faith and where God has done remarkable things. First thing I think of when I come in here is the, it's the, the morning prayers one day. I invited people to pray and perhaps give thanks, but there was stony silence and I thought, Lord, what is going on here? And suddenly a lady burst out, very loudly, like a dam bursting. God, I'm just so thankful that you've shown me that I am not who people say I am. And all those men who stood over me and spat on me and the things that they have said of me as I was abused by so many, that's not who I am. You've made me clean and taken the dirt away to be interrupted by one after the other until a man cried out, Father, I'm just so thankful that the skin by my mouth hasn't any cancer in it anymore. And I could feel everybody's eyes instantly open as we all turned and looked and saw that he'd got flawless skin. But there are so many stories of the wonders that God has done in here. So we're thankful. And we came to the end of morning prayers and there had been a particular guest and as we got up to leave, he caught me by the arm and said, could I have a word with you and tell you what has happened? What he actually said was, yesterday evening, I was aware that I'd be leaving the next morning and I thought of the young people in my church who'd persuaded me to come here. And they had told me that I must visit the High Cross so I decided I would go, and I came to a five-bar gate. But he said, the strange thing is, as I leant on the gate, looking at the cross, I really couldn't move, and I couldn't take my eyes off the cross. And I stayed there for a while, and suddenly I was aware of movement, and somebody else leaning on the same gate, also looking at the cross. And our elbows touch. Could you tell me who you think it was? I said, well, presumably one of the other guests. No, he said, it was Jesus. And I looked at him and he was completely sincere. He said, you know, I'm in my 80s now and I have never known what it is to be alive inside. Jesus looked at me and he reached inside me to the core of my being and he flicked a switch and in an instant, I knew that I was suddenly alive. And I said, well, isn't that absolutely wonderful? And his eyes filled with tears. He said, it is. He said, but I'm in my 80s. How different my life would have been if I'd known Jesus before then. And I said, well, you know, that's right. But the truth is that God is so amazing that even at this stage of life, he can so fill you with life 
that she'll more than make up for everything that she has lost during those years. And he turned and he said, I cannot wait to tell the young people in my church what happened when I went to the cross. One evening in evening prayers, the glory of God visibly appeared and filled the dome. Um, it's, it's almost impossible to describe. It was like something that lives and it filled the whole dome, but it didn't touch the ceiling. It filled the space, but there was just that little gap and it pulsated with glory. With, and the light in here was absolutely amazing. And for perhaps 40 minutes, nobody could move. Nobody could say a word. And there was a sense of a huge weight of glory resting upon us. So utterly unexpected, but absolutely wonderful. A little while ago, we had a couple staying here at Felder Brennan. They were due to leave and, and he was saying to me, I've got a great problem. I've lost my hearing aids, but I don't know what to do because I cannot hear a word unless I'm wearing them. So my wife and I sit there quietly trying not to grin and say, well, have you looked everywhere downstairs? Yes. Have you looked right through the bedroom? Yeah, we dismantled the bed. We looked under it, we looked over it. We've looked in drawers, we've looked everywhere. There's no sign of them, but you can't hear anything at all without them. No, I don't know how we're going to manage. And then I said, is it really very difficult for you if you haven't got your hearing aids? Yeah, I've been telling you, I can't hear anything at all. And my wife says, so how exactly are you hearing us at the moment? And he looked and he went, I can hear. If I pick up a copy now of The Grace Outpouring and look again at what was written there, I see the story of this remarkable move of God. But what has happened since then is that there has been a movement of God the move has carried on, it's changed, it's deepened, it looks rather different, but the still the same things are going on with less froth, but more depth. And we look at that, we didn't plan it, we certainly can't control it, we have given up on any attempt to manage it in any way, but we have to find a way of resourcing it. And we look and say, why is God doing this? from the United States to mainland Europe to Asia to Australasia. God is just running with things. Africa is just crazy, the things that God is doing that we're helping to resource. And so it helps us to stop and reflect and say, what are the key things that God really seems to like and use and anoint? that seem so powerful that they have the effect of having national impact in nations after nations after nations. Why are not only church leaders, but also national political leaders seeing this and in some cases being powerfully affected by it? And so a new book is coming out, which will be called The Way of Blessing, which is a brilliant summary of who we are and what we do and what we walk in. And as we have been working on the first draft of the book and reflecting again on what God has given us and what God is breaking out, all the new and fresh stories that are today's stories, not yesterday's stories. And we're looking forward to sharing this more widely with the readers of The Way of Blessing.
have certainly seen the scope of the ministry of Walter Brennan develop. And God has given us wonderful people on our team who are able to go out within the UK, but to other nations. So we don't own anything. People can't sort of join the family club of nations at Falder Brennan. They can link with us, so we encourage one another, but that's a different matter. Everything we have, we want to give away. And so far, amazingly, God has supplied all that we need. What do we see? We see revival breaking out in power in Wales. Something that won't look anything like it's looked historically in Wales. From which, and excuse my vocabulary, flame carriers, those who are just endued with the presence of God, will go out to nations. Some of them will go out and speak or to share. Others will go on holiday. Some will just be going to visit relatives abroad. But because they're carrying the presence of God, they will ignite fires in the nations. So we're excited about the future. But when we see what God is already doing, the stories of hundreds of people turning to the Lord through what we're going out and sharing with others, and they are putting it to practice, we think, my goodness, if God is doing all this now, what's it going to be like when the full flood comes?